You are live. Could have fooled me. Well, hello, everybody. And uh, it's John Barnwell here in Detroit with my very, very special friend, Dr. Douglas Gabriel, and his wonderful wife, Tyla, the industrious Tyla Gabriel, is lurking around somewhere <laughs> in the background. Producing the show from this end. <laughs> yeah, from that end, yes. And that's good. And uh, this is the second installment of What is Cosmic Intelligence? And it's not this. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Clowns in America. In any event, I shouldn't be so irreverent, but uh, I don't know. I guess. It's well, we're going to go to the most reverent places, so it's yes, okay to be are. a little, a little bit yeah. irreverent to begin with. Yeah, we have to, have to chase the children out of the room. <laughs> Just sitting here for a second, letting a few people check in. Douglas is also in Michigan. He has a storied past. And uh, being that he is one of the principal Waldorf educators in North America, who was referred to by Werner Gloss, who was the leader of Waldorf education in America, as his right hand. So Douglas is a master teacher, and he has numerous degrees and all that. I, I won't get into all that. He can do that if he likes. No, oh, no. I, I want to forget those days. <laughs> Forget all that. You don't forget all your programming. <laughs> yes, but I did have the distinction, the incredible distinction of the moniker of, when I was young, the Waldorf kid or the anthroposophic kid. <laughs> so I guess I was the young one in the group. Now I'm the old one of the old ones in the group, an elder. Yeah, here comes a kid. Make sure you uh, quote properly. Because <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I have my quotes for today, as a matter of fact. I'm always ready with my quotes. Because it's so much, you know, just to say as a preliminary, I know that a lot of your followers um, have studied your book. And, you know, which I said last time is literally one of the most significant books of our century. Because in it is everything you need to know. It would be, it's like the cookbook of how your soul marries the spirit uh, with all the traditions connected to it. So, when we're talking about the things that we talk about, like last time, I tried to justify talking about the truth by giving you 70 quotes from Rudolf Steiner. So this time I put together quotes from um, a number of people, uh, the group that he calls the preschool of theosophy. And theosophy was, of course, the beginning uh, group that Steiner then developed his anthroposophy out of. And he was a theosophist. So these early German writers, he calls preschool theosophists, which blew my mind because I had read it, but I'd forgotten that he said it. It's almost like an insult, but at the same time, he's meaning it as a, as a compliment. So I pulled down some of their quotes on truth. And um, one that was especially good, which we will be uh, connecting and we have connected already through the uh, Gab site, through uh, Gabriel's underscore horn at Gab, uh, where Tyla, also known as Betsy, and her team are posting these days, uh, we posted a bunch of statements of truth from a, a German author called named uh, Karl Eckerthausen. And it was a reference of Steiner's when he was talking about these German philosophers and thinkers that he referenced Karl. And so I went and grabbed from uh, Cloud in the Sanctuary, a very famous document uh, in esoteric studies in the West, uh, some groups considered it one of their core teachings, Cloud on the Sanctuary. And I grabbed a bunch of quotes from that. And I grabbed a bunch of quotes from other books uh, by Carl um, Eckerthausen and uh, put them together. Because I always like to give you something to read so that when we're talking, I hope that the audience understands that we can verify everything we're saying. Whether it's from uh, quoting Western esoteric tradition, uh, you know, different types of spiritual traditions. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is, of course, put in a new way because we're in a new time. So today I'm going to share a few quotes from Steiner with you, as well as somewhere uh, in this connection through what Tyla has done, which I never understand any of that technology that John and Tyla do. 
but uh, they'll make that available for you so that you can read these amazing, very short statements on truth that demonstrate that when you start talking about truth, you're talking about one of the three big things, you know, truth, beauty, and goodness. And truth has a spiritual side and a physical side. So last time we talked a lot about relative truth and absolute truth. Uh, this time we're going to talk about absolute truth is what my understanding is. So I'm very anxious today to speak about uh, celestial intelligence because it is one of probably the top 10 things that you really need to understand if you're going to survive in this uh, world that we're in. Well, <laughs> you made your point. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Yes, cosmic intelligence, or as he says, celestial intelligence. That's perhaps more poetic. Uh, but nonetheless, it has to do with being able to come to an uh, intimate relationship with the divine spiritual powers, according to anthroposophy. Uh, that's one way it would be described. And if you look at two very specific things of, of, the, of the Bible, uh, they can bring you to a, a very focused uh, meditative state. One is the first 14 verses of the Gospel of St. John, and the other is the Lord's Prayer. And I had suggested to Douglas that we might venture into that a little bit. Uh, I would highly recommend anybody going to uh, the Rudolf Steiner archive and looking up the Lord's Prayer, because there's some remarkable material by Rudolf Steiner regarding how the Lord's Prayer essentially it encapsulates all of theosophy or anthroposophy. And it has a certain power in it that Rudolf Steiner indicates because of the nature of prayer and, and the way in which it approaches the Father principle. You know, it says, our Father who art in heaven. And it's brings together that relationship in, in the most humble sense when he adds in the prayer, he puts in, this is moving me so much it's hard to talk, but excuse me for that. But in there, where he includes thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it's this whole idea of that you have a completely deferential opinion uh, regarding your prayer and, and that you're not trying to make commandments to try and control like some kind of magician, but rather that, that when you pray that you, if it's God's will, then it will find fulfillment. And, that, and that's the perspective that that, that prayer carries. And encoded within that prayer, Rudolf Steiner in, in the uh, lecture collection, it's a collection of lectures. I thought I brought it in here, but I didn't. But anyways, it's the Christian mystery is what it's called. It's a collection of lectures from the early period of Rudolf Steiner's lecturing. And in there, he goes into an in-depth explanation about how the Lord's Prayer encapsulates all of the sevenfold being and destiny of man and our relationship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I thought we might explore some of those uh, ideas that, that are so wonderfully expressed by Rudolf Steiner. And so uh, I sent a few items over to Douglas, and I'd love to hear some of his reflections. Well, when you talk about Rudolf Steiner and Christology, I just want to first off say that in my opinion, having uh, studied these things for many years, I would have to say Steiner has the most developed Christology of any person that there is in history. And when you talk about the Lord's Prayer, 
I was recently looking into the um, origins of it because I was uh, attempting to put together what one might call the Q document. And the Q document was the supposed um, sayings that were already quite prevalent in the time of Jesus of Nazareth that undoubtedly he connected onto and changed some of those phrases so that they would mean something different through his expression of those words. So when he only gave us one prayer, and that is the Our Father, it is absolutely significant. And one could say that it was built on tradition. One could say that every time that uh, Jesus of Nazareth states, verily, verily, or truly, truly, that he's probably making reference to existing wisdom axioms, which lived in the minds of the people he was speaking to. So you have to understand these were almost like uh, esoteric or spiritual colloquialisms that were in the mind of everyone who heard what he said. So that is a preface. So if you're a good Christologist and you're studying Christology sources and the, our father, then you would come up with things like that uh, to try in many times in the modern mind to demean the inspiration of Jesus of Nazareth who became Jesus Christ. But Rudolf Steiner gave us again and again, and I won't get into, but I will reference the fact that he gave us a fifth gospel. So there's four uh, canonical gospels, but there's a fifth gospel, and that's Rudolf Steiner had direct clairvoyant experience of what happened at that time. And he wrote this gospel. I highly recommend it, but I don't recommend it to people who are faint of heart or who haven't done their homework and study on all the different views of who Jesus of Nazareth slash Christ is. Because there are more books written about that than any other topic in history. And the opinions are as varied as how many people want to look at it. So when we look at the Our Father, Rudolf Steiner tells us the following, which is, as John was pointing out, these are the very deepest secrets. Uh, I would have to say the most esoteric exercise that I know is to use the Our Father and go down the chakras in an order that was given to me by uh, the top student of Daskalus, and he trained uh, Tyla and myself in these things. And so that exercise I use every single uh, day, and I find it to be one of the most powerful uh, of any of the exercises I've ever uh, encountered, whether it be Tibetan Buddhism or Hinduism or the Upanishads or anything. It doesn't really matter. When it comes down to it, the Our Father is the most significant prayer. I didn't know we were going to be talking about that, but per, per se, so all I can say specifically about uh, truth relative and absolute is the Our Father is absolute truth. It's one of the few things we have that is eternal, and it is an eternal prayer. So Rudolf Steiner says, and gives us insight, which no one else does, that as Jesus of Nazareth in his first 30 years was um, going about his business, he came across a temple of Baal, and he went up to the altar, and he fell down in a swoon, and he heard the cry of humanity, the very longing of humanity that was being cried out and beckoning for intervention from the divine. And what he heard was, and I'm not going to say them because they're actually too sacred to say, uh, because when you say them, you are actually describing the condition of humanity as it faces uh, the battle with the dragon, with you know the different beings, Araman and Lucifer and the Asuras. And so when Christ, when Jesus of Nazareth fell down onto that altar, he heard the Our Father backwards. He heard the exact opposite of what the spiritual traditions were trying to give at that time, as well as what he was trying to give. And so the Our Father is a response to the call of humanity for help. And here we have, according to the Bible, the Son of God coming down to teach us the prayer to reach the Father. And he says that this kingdom is not the his father's kingdom or his kingdom. And so the prayer that we have in this kingdom, the our father is literally the number one way. And then the number two way would be what John said, which is the uh, first 
uh, 13 lines of the Gospel of John, uh, because that is, again, taking all the traditions, congealing them into a way to look at it that is appropriate for humanity at this time. So the Our Father is the best way, in my opinion, to get to absolute truth. And if you wish to meditate on absolute truth or celestial truth, cosmic wisdom, cosmic intelligence, whatever you want to call it, the Our Father definitely, in my opinion, and, and I think also in John's and the first verses of the Gospel of St. John, are the quickest way, the most profound way, and the way that is, in my opinion, the most sanctified. Yes, I mean, when you when you approach such a thing, and it's something that is, is a part of my personal daily uh, regimen, although because I'm human, I sometimes miss out on, on the glorious expression of this transformative versification by our Lord. But you have to delve deeply into it to be able to unlock the secrets that it possesses uh, as far as on level of being able to know personally what is being involved in this whole transformative process. But Rudolf Steiner is very specific when he makes the point that, but it's not necessary that you understand these things for it to have that power, that transformative power. And so that is, is the key issue here. Is that so many teachings, it's like if you don't understand the teaching itself, it doesn't have the same effect as, as, as when you enter into understanding. With the Lord's Prayer, it, yeah, you can have additional features that, that come to in your development in relationship to the Lord's Prayer by understanding the sevenfold nature of this proclamation, which is essentially what it is. It's a, a proclamation of commitment. And uh, it's, it's reaffirming your relationship to the Father and the will of the Father so that in in the East, they would call that Atman. And that's the spirit man that Rudolf Steiner describes. And that's the human component of, of that particular principle. And so in, in coming into relationship, that's the will. And if you take this and, and work with it, it works in you. And he also makes the point of various places that there's different versions, uh, different translations. Uh, for example, you can go on YouTube and you'll find the Aramaic, the original Aramaic of the Lord's Prayer, which is very, very powerful. Uh, he also says that the Latin version is more powerful uh, as, as its effect than the translations into uh, modern languages. But in getting closer to this as something that you make a part of uh, your life, uh, it's, again, I want to emphasize that it's something that will work in you regardless of whether you understand what it means. And so the simplest soul can bring about self-transformation by working with the Lord's Prayer, just as the most uh, developed great mind could keep entering into it deeper and deeper and deeper because it's it basically contains all of anthroposophy. And so all of the 6,700 plus lectures of Rudolf Steiner are contained in the Lord's Prayer, literally and actually, but in seed form. And so it plants a seed in you that's transformative. But to get to the deeper levels of this, I hearken back to the meditation that Rudolf Steiner gave about Moses and the golden calf. And so the other side of the story is the, the challenge that Moses had in dealing with the, the Erevrav, the mixed multitude, the, the Sitra Akra, the ones that are outside of uh, 
the dispensation. The ones that he, against the advice of Jehovah, brought with him out of Egypt into the Holy Land. And so they're basically the troublemakers. And so when he goes away, he comes back. And what are they doing? They're worshiping the golden calf. Well, that golden calf represents the sheath nature, that which is uh, your identification with your worldly existence. You know, So it's your all your stuff and your family and your relatives and your the city you live in, the state and the world, so to speak. Your personal world is an expression of this golden calf. And, and remember, our Lord said, my kingdom is not of this world. And they frequently refer to uh, the opponent as the prince of this world. So you see what we're dealing with here is that that whole idea of the, what are you going to do about the illusion in which we live? Because we have this illusory realm of space and time in which we live, the realm of the hermetic realm of space and the mosaic realm of time. And so you have these, these mysteries that are encoded in the esoteric teachings. And it's all so wonderfully encoded in the Lord's Prayer, but it has to be approached with proper reverence. In fact, one of the masters uh, had said to Rudolf Steiner that he only does it once a month, and he spends the rest of the month preparing to pronounce it. Yes, uh, I, I'm going to add a, another note to that, and that's that Rudolf Steiner uh, rewrote it for himself, so it would be more impactful for himself in terms of the way that he perceived things. So he would, he was noted for being, people could hear him outside of his room every day, a few times a day, he would stand up and say the Lord's Prayer very loudly. And he changed some words, and so people would, you know, listen to the door, and they, they this is one of the exercises that he was uh, happy to do uh, as, quite aloud to the point that he was literally almost shouting to God. Now, I've changed it, only one word. Of course, the Pope changed it recently and tried to change up the Our Father and, and make it into something completely opposite of what it is. But when I say it, I say Our Father, Our Mother. So, because I believe in in the also the female, because uh, right there with God, who isn't of this kingdom, well, who is of this kingdom? That would be Sophia, Mother Sophia. And so I put, our father, our mother together. But so you can, uh, don't change it much, but change it if you need to, uh, because some people are insulted by uh, the thought of a male God instead of a female goddess. And so take the our father and uh, work with it. And uh, I'll give you a slight hint. All you have to do is start walking it from your top chakras to the bottom, saying one phrase at a time, going down your seven chakras, bringing a ball of light, basically the love of Christ into your body. And it is, according to some people who use this practice, one of the most profound things there is. And Steiner wrote, Steiner believed that, of course, he uh, did a lecture on this where he breaks it down into uh, great detail and in profound esotericism. Valentin Tomberg's most sacred writing, which they still don't release to the public, is his studies on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, as well as when you look at the Christian's so many have written on this. Uh, there, it, It's an untold amount of books. But I like what you just said. You know, we are born into our father, the prince of this world. That is Lucifer, according to the Bible stories. Remember, he was kicked out of heaven for his pride in a way because he wanted the absolute. And what happened? He became the relative. He was cast down to the earth and became the particular instead of being up in the general. As you always used to say, it's the general and the particular, and in between there's a vast world. So when Lucifer was cast down, let's remember he was the highest angel. He had wisdom that was cosmic wisdom, cosmic intelligence, we can call it, celestial intelligence. But when he was cast down to the earth, and I don't know if, uh, if this is the way you look at it, but I look at it, Lucifer as being kind of a time being who's out of time. He, he had all this intelligence, and he brought it even to the earth when he incarnated according to Rudolf Steiner and others, approximately 2000 BC in China. And that 
astounding intelligence, which was celestial and became human, existed right up until the age of the Gnostics, according to Rudolf Steiner. And that wisdom that was given by Lucifer, now you're thinking, wait, Lucifer's evil. Yeah, he's evil when he acts at the wrong time. We all become God, but Lucifer wanted to be God and knock God off his throne and have all of his powers and his wisdom and his intelligence and his beauty and his truth and strength and all this. Well, that was horribly prideful. He needed to wait. Now, we're you little human beings. Remember, in the apocalypse, it says when this beast was cast from the heavens, he was a dragon-like, and his tail swept up one-third of humanity and pulled them down to the earth where he was falling to. So the fallen angel Lucifer brought humans down, and in a way, we can actually thank Lucifer if we take what he taught in the ancient times through human beings, through inspiration, and later through actually incarnating, and then putting it literally into the teachings that led to the Gnostics, which... Without the Gnostics, we wouldn't have understood the Trinity, according to Rudolf Steiner. So without Lucifer, we would not have understood the Trinity. How can you have a double paradox that the Father is the Son but isn't the Son, and the Son is the Father but isn't, and the Father is the Holy Spirit but isn't really, and so they're separate but different, and they're acting at different time periods, and they're acting in different ways. So the Father created the past. Christ is in the present, and the Holy Spirit is the future, one could say. But Lucifer, so that's the proper timing. Lucifer came down and wanted to give to humanity too early all this celestial wisdom. Now, when I say celestial wisdom, what would that be? That would be, for instance, what today in the, uh, the secular humanist modern scientific mind would call DNA. Let's talk about DNA for a second. DNA is perfect. It actually replicates the motion of the sun and the planets we now know. We, we, all of our theories are displanted every, supplanted, excuse me, every few years. And one of the theories that the planets rotate around the sun in an uh, ellipse or in a certain, you know, whatever, uh, and that they rotate and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's partially correct. But they did computer analysis. In other words, they got a bigger picture. And the bigger picture shows that we follow behind the sun, exactly as Rudolf Steiner said in his astronomy course, we are pulled by a cable toe behind the sun. And I've, I've gone into that a lot in, in uh, my podcasts, if you want to know more about that. Um, these magnetic ropes, they're called, from the sun to each of the planets, pulls the planets behind them. In other words, we're one unit, we're like DNA. So here's DNA, it's the exact same motion as the sun and the planets, as the whole solar system is moving, and that's wisdom. But what happens when we get in and start messing with it, which we're doing right now, messing with messenger RNA, messing with DNA, messing with things that belong to celestial intelligence? In the human body is the greatest truth. So as we re realize who we are, and as these bodies uh, grow and evolve, and as we uh, learn the wisdom that's in them, we're actually connecting to celestial intelligence that came to the earth. But Lucifer brings intelligence that is too fast, too much, and takes you out of your body and makes you irresponsible. Whereas on the other hand, the person that most people would call Satan, Rudolf Steiner calls Araman, is the Lord of this world. He's the Lord of death and calcification and illness, and he loves making people sick and ill. And so these two fight back and forth, almost like a left and right hand of your body. And in the middle are other beings called Asuras who are working for the future Antichrist, the, the being called Sauroth, the sun demon. So when we're talking about intelligence, we're talking about all of those beings in us. They're all available to us. Some of them are fallen, fallen hierarchy. They work from the planets. They work particularly properly for your heart and war uh, warmed up thinking, you know, imagination, inspiration, and intuition, they work directly from the sun. But those forces have come to the earth at the proper time in 1840. And later than in 1879, the archangel of the sun, Michael, came to the earth and brought cosmic intelligence with that angel, the archangel, and all the beings that had been in the sun Basically, you call it a school. Rudolf Steiner literally gives it a name, uh, that it is the uh, mother school 
of humanity. It's the mother lodge of humanity. And so some of us did our training with Michael on the sun before he came and started to bring cosmic intelligence at the right time in 1879. So Lucifer brings it too quick. Armin brings it in a way that is a lie and always twists it up and tries to stop evolution. Lucifer would like to speed up evolution until we explode. But in the middle, we have the Archangel Michael, who is the son of Sophia, according to the traditions, because she has a very manifold being. You could even say she is threefold, because one part of her is all of the wisdom I'm talking about is all given by one hierarchy called the Kyriotetes, or the beings of wisdom. That's celestial intelligence. It's, as, it's not facts. It's not what brain-bound thinking or what we call shadow thinking or materialistic thinking. We can't e that type of thinking can't even conceive of what I'm saying. You can't conceive of an angel, let alone you go, angel, which is in your astral body. The archangels are in your etheric body. The archai are in your physical body. So the physical body is not something to be thrown away or considered to be something bad. It is a seat of wisdom study. It is the school. It's the temple of wisdom that we can study and find out the way that the hierarchies work. So the beings in the Kyriotetes, they don't work through the planets. The beings who are underneath them, the dynamis, and these are also called powers, mights, and dominions, and many other names, but they are beings of motion. And they control the, basically making sure the harmony of all the planets ray into the human being, into our organs, into the seven chambers of the head, the seven chambers of our heart, and the seven chambers of our organs, our major organs. But right now, it's mostly the organs that the planetary effects come into. And without that, we'd have no life. But the seed of it, the seed of true intelligence that is with the proper progressing souls is through the Archangel Michael, who is bringing the wisdom of Sophia into the human being. And every time it does, every time you have a cosmic thought, an, a, a celestial intelligent thought, the being of Sophia passes through your body and records it as part of your future evolution. So Sophia is as intimate to cosmic thinking as anyone can be. And Michael is the archangel of our time since 1879 for approximately 360 years, the archangel Michael's influence is our time spirit, our zeitgeist. And what does he have? He has cosmic wisdom. And I say he, but there's no he or she in the spiritual world. So if I refer to Sophia as feminine or God as male or Mike, that's not really quite right. It's, it, it, we can't really understand these things with human thinking. Matter of fact, as we stand on, according to Rudolf Steiner, when we stand on the rings of Saturn and we look out towards the star, that's as far as our human thinking can take us. Because celestial thinking has nothing to do with earthbound thinking. But earthbound thinking has in it the shadow of celestial thinking. And you can start to see the patterns and the workings of truth, relative truth, that can lead you then to the little bit of absolute truth that we can understand. But the big picture is in time. If we don't do it properly in time, it's all incorrect. So when, before Michael came to the earth, Araman came to the earth with materialism in 1840 and is here now. And basically the religion of materialism is the default religion of everyone who doesn't have a religious belief. And now I want to quantify that. Rudolf Steiner said, each one of us is our own church. We must develop our own North Star. We must indeed develop our own temple of wisdom. So when I say church or religion, I'm talking about the word religion, relinkio, relinking to the spiritual world. When you relink to the spiritual world, you are directly experiencing celestial intelligence. Down here right now, machine intelligence is taking over. Human intelligence is being dimmed down so bad that it's actually creating a crucifixion of this of the spiritual beings, especially Christ and the etheric. A crucifixion because materialism creates cold, gray, shadow thinking. 
artificial intelligence. It's not even human intelligence. It's below. It's between the human, the animal, and then the computer helps us by bringing minerals up into the plant realm so that our phone looks like it's alive. It looks like it could grow. It looks like it you know, has the force of, of life. It doesn't. Those are lies. That's subnature. That's Araman's lies. And it's gifts of Lucifer coming too fast. There's not a person on the face of the earth who understands their smartphone completely. Because literally millions of people have written the programs to create what we use and have no gratitude for, no understanding for, and we so certainly don't deserve it. So every time we use these luciferically inspired harmonic devices, we are giving up of our own intelligence and our own ego, and we're becoming who? Lucifer, thinking that we deserve the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnipresence that all of these mechanical devices deliver to us through artificial intelligence. So there is a battle. Michael fights the dragon. The dragon is Araman. That is the being who wishes to kill your thinking. And he also battles Lucifer, holding Lucifer at sway, letting the cosmic wisdom come down at the right time. So there is a battle. And that battle is literally in your bloodstream. We could go into great detail in that way. But the point is your ego is being fought over by Lucifer, Araman, the Asuras, and particularly the materialism that they have instilled in humanity to basically try to kill cosmic intelligence coming into the human heart. Well, yes. You saved me a lot of explaining, and, I, and I, I'm grateful for that. I wanted to give a background because I know when you talk, people don't understand how what the, the thoughts you're saying are as deep as they really are. So yeah. sometimes I'm just yeah. explaining it for the uh, younger group in the crowd who may just becoming familiar with these things. Well, you are a master teacher, I have no doubt. And... Uh, <clears throat> But it's important to understand in being able to be uh, approaching this from a living thinking, not just dead, compartmentalized, categorical thinking. I mean, it's good to, to know that, just as it's good to know mathematics. But you can't eat mathematics. Well, you could try, but you can't. And uh, you can't uh, create a seed from a mathematical formula as much as you might think you'd like to. And that's what they're attempting to do is, is rewrite uh, this code. And I remember I had a spontaneous experience when I was about 16 years old and I all of a sudden just started talking about DNA. And the everything that I said, uh, I still agree with. And basically what I said was that the DNA represented the spiral of, of the evolutionary development of humanity and consciousness, but that it was not inside the DNA, that the DNA is more like a crystal radio. It's the way in which we can hear the, the music of the spheres, the singing of the angels, what have you. And so when you start messing around with that through scientism, it's probably the, the biggest mistake that, that one could make. I think it, it, it's very much approaching uh, because you're slaying uh, the divine ideas and, and bringing them just falling to earth. And so if anybody thinks it's a good idea to start doing manipulations within that realm from a scientific view, uh, you might want to think about it a little longer. But in, in getting into the whole idea of the fluid approach, like Douglas explained, taking the Our Father, like uh, Duskalos' his students, uh, Stylianos of Tesla, the Cypriot initiate, that was uh, quite remarkable. And I've told stories about him before, but he's, he's, a, he's very much a key individual in regards to our little conclave here and uh, but in understanding somebody like that who who is a, a spiritual healer in the name of Christ and uh, a true disciple 
of the spiritual stream in which we're continually in discussions about, along with Peter Dunoff or Ben Seduno of Bulgaria. Those are the three principal teachers that I, I feel most comfortable with, Rudolf Steiner, Ben Seduno, and Daskalos. And so uh, I think that if you gravitate towards them, I think you might find them very nourishing. But nonetheless, in getting back to this whole fluid idea, just as he shared Daskalos' meditative technique going and proceeding through the chakras, likewise, you could say that the father principle is that will impulse that you find in your heart and that when you blush or when you turn cold with fear that it's that will aspect that that's being asserted and that's that that core principle within the heart of the atman and uh, theosophists like to call it atma but it's it's atman it's got an n on the end classical sanskrit and then as you move up from there, you get to the, the Buddhic principle. And that's with one, one D, not two Ds, the way you frequently see it. The two Ds, that represents uh, Buddha, the Tama Buddha, which is specifically associated with this throat chakra. But that's where you involve the, the uh, 16 petal lotus of the throat chakra and the, the eightfold path of, of the Buddha. So that you have that instilling within the feeling realm. And that's of the realm of, of speech is that you could imbue your speech with this warmth. And, and that's such a critical realm because that's a, an expression of the logos. And so that when you go to the, the crown chakra and there you have, and the, and the brow chakra, that whole dynamic, the pineal, and pituitary that dwell within the castle of Lucifer, see? And, and the, the Sophia principle is, is rescuing the damsel from Lucifer. Sophia's the damsel, right? Uh, Sophia Achamas, she's the, the falling nature in the Gnostic traditions is Sophia Achamas. She's fallen, that the wisdom is fallen. And so, or that's Kundri in, in the Grail legends, that she's uh, the maiden in, at the castle of Klingsor. This is Klingsor's castle right here, right? And the, the, the phosphines in the brain and that whole uh, neurological uh, capacity. That, and so, but that's Manas that, uh, when it goes to its higher level. But you see that you have your, your, will aspect of the Father, the Son principle, and the Holy Spirit. So that's another way you can look at this. But in getting into understanding the mission of the Buddha, because this is the Mars chakra right here, see, and, and Buddha is specifically associated with being able to bring uh, the alternative in the Mars sphere to conflict and to be able to find resolution of conflict through the pursuit of the Eightfold Path. And so the, in working through that, you can see that there's uh, an attribute happening there of compassion. And so we have to see that, that uh, Lucifer, uh, Rudolf Steiner, would, in the most simple sense, he would say, uh, Lucifer is wisdom without love. And it's it, through the mission of Buddha and Krishna and Master Zarathustra and the, the Mother Lodge that's, that the second half of Earth evolution is where we're able to take this wisdom and consecrate it through love. Like our Lord said, God is love. And he didn't mean it as a metaphor. But you see, Jesus also said, be ye wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. So you see, you, you don't deny the wisdom. You transmute the wisdom. And the transmutation process, the, the, the handmaiden of the transformation process, that is the Sophia. 
and and Rudolf Steiner said that it's not Christ we lack, it's the Sophia that we lack. It's that redemption of that that wisdom principle of, of Athena or Isis, and a lot of people that are fundamentalists they get all freed oh they're leaving right now I can hear them running out of the room, and that's okay they they're still dwelling in fear, and and you have to be able to uh, expand because in coming uh, in humility before the, the principle of the divine trinity, it requires humility to be able to have that same transformative effect. And so, but when one does that, it's like you're becoming like a force of, of the divine company. I mean, the, your words will have a new power. And like the ancient yogis say, if you always speak the truth, then whatever you say will become true. See, so you have to guard your speech. In fact, don't talk over much. Because the more you talk, the more falsehood you're going to create. Because how often are you wrong in the course of a day? And so we chatter along and, and, and we say all these things and think we know something. And then we find out especially if you're studying Rudolf Steiner and you think you got it all figured out. and They finally published that one lecture cycle you've been waiting for to get translated for German and you find out, no, you had it all wrong. And that's okay. That's a part of it. It's something that you're building because you're building this, this, this spiritual hut that, that is, is that transformative process. And the nice thing about it is if, you, if all of a sudden you fall off the path and you start screwing up, well, that's still waiting for you. Once you've made those those changes, they're still there. You may not be able to take advantage of it in the same way, but it's still there. And so in transforming uh, your astral or desire nature brings about manas, which is the spirit self. And when, and when you transform your etheric body of memory and life force and all of that, Egyptians would call it the ka. And they would call that the astral, they call that the ba. But when you start working into this transformation of, of the etheric, which one can do most readily through exposing yourself to fine art, like the paintings of Raphael or Michelangelo and these, uh, Da Vinci, and just looking at the Last Supper. And it's much better to get uh, uh, actual image of the Last Supper rather than those cheesy uh, prints that they make, although they have value too. But nonetheless, there's this, this whole idea that you can fortify your etheric body. It, 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 that transformation takes much slower. And the third level of transformation is the transformation of the physical. And uh, eventually, once you complete that, the, the physical becomes the, the phantom physical as it expresses the Atman in the most complete sense in as far as your human nature. And so that's basically what we're talking about. I'm so glad you brought up the Holy Grail because that wisdom that's in the human body can be found right there. And I want to clarify something about what I said about the chakras after what you just said to make sure I haven't confused people. Uh, yes, Rudolf Steiner says the Holy Grail is found in the head and that when you go to the corpus quadra gemini, this little cube that the pineal gland sits on in the midbrain in the fourth ventricle, the 12 cranial nerves come through that cube. And the cube is actually broken up into um, eight other cubes. And the way it resonates when all those nerves come through informs the pineal gland, and the pineal gland is the master gland that controls all the ductless glands, and basically that controls everything in your body, your aging, your metabolism, everything, your sexuality. And so that, he said, is a physical locality for, in the human body, an analogy for the Holy Grail. And he says that essentially, when you're on the path to the Grail, you're going to probably be a soldier, a warrior, and you're going to have a spear and a sword. And when you finally find the grail, you may get in, you may not get in, you may get in and not ask the right question. 
But if you ask the right question, you're going to then see a spear that drips blood above a chalice being carried in the room in a procession by um, the Grail Maidens. Uh, and what is that telling us? He says that when we start our development in today's age, we start usually in our head. And once you use your head and intelligence to find the grail and you have the spear and the sword, because remember, Michael carries a spear and a sword. Michael has a sword that um, basically um, defies ignorance. It's the sword or spear that cast Lucifer out of heaven. In the Tibetan tradition, it's called Manjushri. Manjushri holds a sword to chop off the heads of those who are being ignorant. Same thing with the Kalki avatar, who's incarnated according to the Hindu tradition in our time now. She, sometimes they say she's a, a, a she, the 10th incarnation of Vishnu, carries a sword. And anybody who's not paying attention, who's being ignorant on purpose, they chop their head off. Why? Because the head is this image of the grail, and it's trying to wake you up to the fact that your thoughts are not your thoughts if they are spiritual thoughts. They are being loaned to you by the hierarchical beings. If it's a thought, it's loaned to you by the angels. If it's an inspiration, it's loaned to you for that fraction of a second as it inspires you and lights you up by the archangels. If you are driven to do something good, because you know it's good and your heart and your mind tells you you must do it, then you're highly likely working with the time spirit. Because when good comes into intuition or the willpower, you become literally an agent of Michael, the time spirit who rose up from an archangel to be an archai in 1879. So Steiner says that you can either take a sword or a spear, and once you find the grail, then you dive down to the heart and stab it so that it begins to bleed. And that blood, if it's the blood of Christ, if it's the etheric blood, rises up exactly as you just described, John, from the heart to the crown chakra, the pineal gland. Now, earlier I said that one of the exercises of Doskalus and Paul Scorpin, who taught Tyler and I these methodologies, is to use the Our Father and go from the crown chakra to the base chakra, and then put that energy into the earth, into the golden center of the earth, so that then it comes out literally, quite literally, in the aurora borealis as your higher thinking, feeling, and willing. So as you basically have this consecration, this... Um, uh, benediction, this uh, sanctifying of your chakras coming from the top to the bottom, that's quite different than what you're supposed to do consciously. That is a faith thing. Because as John pointed out, the Our Father, if you just say it, it will change you. So if you use that exercise, just be aware that that's not the way that we do it consciously in this age, for instance. Up until the time of the mystery of Golgotha, the death of Christ, the death and resurrection of Christ, that was the what Steiner called, it was a previous period called Mars, but it doesn't matter what it's called. It's a previous period that built you up to your base chakra, your sex chakra, your chi chakra, and then how you want to debate it, the other one or two chakras, but certainly your solar plexus chakra was all developed before the time of Christ because we didn't have a thinking ego. We didn't have the capacity to turn our heart into the organ of supersensible perception that it can become. But at that time we were given the seed for that. So every single human on the earth has, has that seed. But whether they will take the spear of the grail and stab their own heart, like Odin stabbed himself when he hung himself on Yggdrasil, so that the great world tree, so that he could be, get the wisdom, the cosmic wisdom called the runes, you have to stab yourself so your heart bleeds. And then a thing called the etherization of the blood can happen, which then goes from your heart to your throat chakra, to your crown chakra, to your, excuse me, a brow chakra to a crown chakra, right? Just as John described. And there's a thousand ways to describe this. But here's the big message. Michael was supposed to have helped you conquer, out of your own free will, the lower chakras below the heart already 
in previous work, previous incarnations, or you could do it in this incarnation, in one incarnation, if you don't believe in reincarnation. But you have to conquer your lower desires of sex and hunger and comfort and anger and all the lower things in the lower chakras. And then you can start in the heart. But generally, in the West, you're going to start in the head and you're going to pierce the heart. And when it starts to bleed, then that can actually rise up. And that is the proper way that you're supposed to develop yourself. Now, I'm glad that you brought up just, you know, some of the topics you did so that we could go astray. And as Tyler says, go off into the weeds a little bit and talk about other things. I'm going to give you a couple quotes here to justify what it is that I said earlier. This is from, and this is where it gets very anthroposophic. Now, you're supposed to put on your German hat and you're supposed to understand that this is, you know, just the way that it is. Karmic relationships, esoteric studies, evolution of the Michael principle throughout the ages, the split in the cosmic intelligence. That's a title of one lecture <laughs> for Rudolf Steiner. Uh, volume three, by the way, lecture 11 in uh, the collected works, volume number 235. Um, great lecture cycle because it talks about the way that cosmic intelligence became human intelligence. And I'm going to give you a couple quotes. The soul of man is intelligent on earth, but this intelligence is a drop of the fullness of what Michael pours forth like a rain of intelligence flowing out over mankind, humankind. Intelligence means the mutual relationship of conduct among the higher hierarchies. What they do, how they relate themselves to one another, what they are to one another, this is cosmic intelligence. It is the contrast between the intelligences of all the planets and the intelligence of the sun. The sun intelligence stands paramountly under the domination, excuse me, dominion. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bad thing. Now, I'm a good anthroposophist. I go back, read the sentence again. Sorry. Uh, it is the contrast between the intelligences of all the planets and the intelligence of the sun. The sun intelligence stand paramountly under the dominion of Michael, while the other planetary intelligences are subject to the other archangels. Thus, the whole cosmic intelligence is administered by Michael. All human intelligence comes from Michael in the sun. In the 8th or 9th century AD was the point of time in the evolution of civilized mankind when the cosmic intelligence gradually moved down to the earth, took shape, as it were, in many single drops, which then lived on as personal intelligence in single human souls. So I wasn't making a poetic analogy when I said a drop of literally the etheric blood of Christ, in other words, cosmic intelligence, comes to your heart and it stays there and it becomes then that which literally bleeds your higher thinking, feeling and willing into the spiritual world and it nourishes them. And Rudolf Steiner says, this is a cycle called the earthly and cosmic nutrition cycle. So if we start the cycle in our heart and we send up to the pineal gland worthy enough thinking, feeling, and willing, transformed into imagination, inspiration, and intuition, it becomes nourishment for the higher hierarchy. So as we're thinking these cosmic thoughts, sometimes just by reading Rudolf Steiner, that's why just reading spiritual things can cause you to go into one of these moments where you are in communion with the divine and you didn't really do much except open yourself up to it because you have to become empty for them to come in. So if you want to have a cosmic intelligence, you have to be willing to let your thinking, feeling, and willing be literally, according to Rudolf Steiner and others, chewed up and eaten by the higher hierarchy because they gave us this stuff. And when we give it back to them in a new form, it's like a, a baby plant that you just planted that's going to grow into the lettuce that you're going to eat for your salad. I mean, you're not going to kill the lettuce to trim it, uh, and it's going to keep on growing, and you are the one who started it. So it's kind of like that. These are the drops that come into the moral human heart that then become the vehicle for spiritual development. So I didn't mean to confuse you saying do an exercise to go from your head to your lower chakras and into the earth unless you're prepared for that because that empties you. 
But then to fill yourself, you start from the heart, go to the crown. And then when you have achieved cosmic intelligence, then you open yourself and let it come in. And it can come in as an imagination, as warmed up thinking. It can come in as an inspiration, which may only last for a nanosecond and yet inspire you for the rest of your life. It can come in as an intuition. But if it comes in as an intuition, you know it's an intuition because it gives you a fiery strength of morality in your heart to go out and do good. All true intuition is direct alignment with the spiritual world. So I think I, that quote you quoted before was absolutely perfect. So it's like, when is it you and when is it the divine acting through you? When is it the grace of God and when is it your own spiritual development that rises to the grace of God? or the grace of the divine, however you want to see it. Uh, that is the question, and that is what we're about here. But Michael is an archangel of the sun. There's other archangels on the planets. They work with the spirits of, the, of uh, motion to keep that in beautiful harmony. But Michael, one distinction here, in 1879 came down from the realm of the sun as an archai, rising to the realm of the archai to be our time spirit, and with it, he brought cosmic intelligence. So right now, poor John, poor John Barnwell, he has all those books. I can go online and get them now. <laughs> Araman provides for us the wisdom of almost every tradition, in because we're very prideful, luciferic beings in English. We have to have it in English for us today, and we can get it for free. Some of the best research I've ever done in my life now comes from the books I get online that I couldn't afford to buy otherwise. And they give the direction for you to develop that path from the heart up into cosmic intelligence, which is literally above your head. It goes much further, uh, right on up into the divine world, the realm that Rudolf Steiner calls Devashan, or what John just called monastic principle, which is, of course, imagination. Uh, uh, manas, Bodhi, and Atman. Manas is imagination, Bodhi is inspiration, and Atman is intuition. So you can have those for very brief moments, and they can inspire your life completely for the rest of your life. So don't be worried that you don't have a cosmic thought all the time. Navalis used to walk around with a pad, and, and he'd be struck with a cosmic thought, and he'd write it down. And they're the most amazing things that I've ever read. So you can become that vessel for these cosmic thoughts by either study and then relaxing that study so that you become those beings that you are studying or simply through a pure heart and following that path that John gave so beautifully before. So uh, perhaps it would be helpful at this point to kind of give a little bit of a summation from Rudolf Steiner himself in his lecture on the structure of the Lord's Prayer. He says, the physical body is sustained by the processes of metabolism, the continuous interchange of forces and substances. The etheric body is that which holds the balance between the different members of the community and may incur debt. So that's an important attribute when we're thinking in terms of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debtors. Finally, we have the astral body, which must not fall into sin, and the ego, which must not become the victim of egoism, of evil. This lower quaternary unites with the higher triad, the divine essence, the Atman, which is will, Buddhi, which is the kingdom, as in thy kingdom come, and manas, as in name. So that when, uh, and that's the end of reference to that quotation, so that you see the important uh, thing is that we begin from the name. And that's the, the, the beginning of the process of leavening, so to speak. And that the whole idea of the name. In ancient Egypt, they had uh, a system of five attributes that characterized the spirit soul configuration uh, of the human being. But one of them was what they called the Ren, 
and the ren is the name. And that's that essence that, that makes you distinct from, from others, right? And so you'll see, like in, in ancient Egyptian history, you'll see where they'll go and they'll, they've scratched out cartouches of like uh, Akhenaten or Queen Hatshepsut, people that, that tried to go against the established authority tradition. So that you, the one way of dealing with that is uh, scratch out their name because it's, it's it's that name that's going to be indicative that they've even existed. And, and, or you see in the Talmud, instead of referring to, to Jesus as Yeshua, they refer to him as Yeshu. Well, Ye Yeshu is a, a, a word, a Hebraic word, uh, meaning may his name be obliterated. So they're, they're trying to absolutely uh, vacate that that the position in in certain passages of the Talmud so that there's always this attempt by the opposition forces to try and prevent what we're talking about from coming to fruition but that's what makes us strong is it's that we have this this uh, opposition and because you see if you go back uh, really one of the few students of uh, direct students of Rudolf Steiner that dealt with ancient Egypt in any uh, specific depth. He even went to Egypt and he spent a lot of time dealing with its contents. This was Aaron Fred Pfeiffer, who is basically the progenitor of the, the diagrams that are found in my book, uh, the, the, the basic, and you know, I added on it considerably, of course, as as anybody who has the books knows, especially Douglas, he knows, because he was there and he wrote the foreword. But in coming to this cosmic understanding and being able to have a way to, to represent your relationship and to take your name and understanding what it is as a particular potency, that's... When, when you begin to overcome your astral nature, your astral body of desire and sympathy and antipathy, you start to fashion out of that what's called manas or the spirit self. And that's the beginning of your journey. And were you to fully accomplish that, you would have no need for a guardian angel because you would have, have entered into that realm to where you have a custodial relationship. Uh, were one to transform their etheric body, that would get them beyond uh, the the submission to the dictates of the community in which you live. That you were you've transcended that you've you've entered into the realm of the archangels, right? And and likewise, to, to, of course, it's so far flung, but the transformation that takes place with the spirit man is, is that absolute transformation uh, that was given to us uh, through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that he, he is actually brought to earth. He's the only being from the upper spiritual world to come to earth and have the human experience. And not only have the human experience, but he was able to take and transform it and give the absolute prototype for the being and destiny of humanity and in the resurrection and, and the whole uh, experience and likewise with the, the, the Pentecost experience of being able to enter into relation to the Holy Spirit. And, and that is that thing, the, the principle of the Holy Spirit represents that manas, and the, the principle of the Logos is the Son, and the Father is the Atman, as I, I keep reiterating. And that being said, since I've mentioned them, I might as well mention my books that, that Douglas and I have referred to occasionally. This is the Arcana of the Grail Angel, and this is my first book, 640 pages, The Spiritual Science 
of the Holy Grail, of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order. And Douglas wrote the foreword to it from my Verticordia Press. And the sequel to that is The Arcana of Light on the Path. This is more of a meditative tool and the complete series of grail diagrams with additional diagrams is included in this second volume so that you have all of the various people tell me I go through it too quickly so they can't peek at it when I'm stopping you. But anyway, there's a great many diagrams that could take and develop what we're trying to talk about here. And and so if you wanted to get a hold of those books, you could get them directly in the US on eBay from myself. And you can contact me. There's a link below to my academia page. And you can do it through there. Uh, and if you're outside the US, you can also contact me through the academia link because I can make arrangements with you to be able to get the books because you wouldn't be able to get them through eBay. And Douglas's books uh, are available on Amazon. And uh, what can I say? What, what profound works of, of, of synthesis that he's been able to come up with for, for anybody who has a need to understand Waldorf education. He's one of the greatest teachers of that in North America. And then he also has his other works. And the works that he's done with his wonderful wife, Kyla, the Gospel of Sophia, in several uh, volumes. I think it's three volumes at this point. And so, and there's other materials that they have that are available you can download for free. Uh, so uh, you might want to check out American Intelligence Media, and there's links on the landing page that can get you to uh, their uh, Sophia uh, material and, and the neo-anthroposophy, as they like to call it the new anthroposophy, which is not an Americanization per se. Don't, don't get the wrong idea. There are, there are those, I, I remember Rosemary Gabert once said to me, Hans Gabert's wife, and she says, I don't think Americans can understand anthroposophy. <laughs> and I think that, that, that there's some merit to that, and, and you have to say, well, what does that mean? But see, we're all a product of our sheath nature to uh, a greater or lesser extent. And the challenge that is put forward by Rudolf Steiner is for us to be able to, through working with things like the Lord's Prayer and being able to become transformative to where you get beyond your sheath nature and you, it goes back to that whole imagination that Rudolf Steiner gave about Moses that takes, he, he comes back and he finds them worshiping the golden calf. That's the sheath nature. And so what does he do? He takes the golden calf and he burns it, turns it to ash and puts it in pure water and makes them drink it. So you have to take it, transform it, and then recycle it, right? And, 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 in looking at that, you can connect that to what Douglas said about the food of the gods, that our spiritual strivings are literally food for the hierarchies. They've been working so long on our behalf. If we don't get to something that we should do, that they do it for us. You know, it's just, we're getting cues all the time, like the little story I told about the, the, driving my car with a little child in the middle of the road and the bird gets in the way with a big twig in his mouth like stop stop so i slow down and there's this little child sit playing with toys less than two years old you know so what is that i mean we're dwelling within the realm of just tremendous uh, cosmic forces but we've become so fallen so mundane it's as if we're living our existence on black and white TV. I, it brings to mind a dear friend of ours, 
uh, we have time for a digression here. Uh, Eve Hardy, uh, what a wonderful soul. And, and she truly is, uh, in the history of uh, Waldorf education in Michigan, uh, a true cleric. And, and that she had uh, a force of will that was quite remarkable. And, and she had a lectern in her library. She would read her Steiner books standing up, okay? She said, oh, no, I never sit down when I read Steiner. I always stand up. So that the kind of dedication and, and what that might mean to somebody who's an anthropologist. But I remember her home that was near the Waldorf Institute, and she had a wonderful biodynamic garden. But she had this huge picture window in her living room. And outside the picture window, you could see I don't know, it must have been 40 different kinds of birds all flittering around because she knew what plants to grow to attract the birds. And I saw birds in her garden that I don't remember ever seeing in Michigan, but if you plant the right plants, then you will attract the birds. And so she had this, this wonderful symphony of, of bird nature going on in her backyard. And, and that kind of ties into her biography because she was the girlfriend of Ornette Coleman, who's one of the most prominent figures in American jazz. And so to say that Americans can't understand anthroposophy, well, I say Germans don't understand jazz. <laughs> That's my answer to that. And, but That's Coleman, good, John. <laughs> and, and it really hurts because Steiner said jazz is the music of the future. And so you're telling the poor anthroposophists they don't understand the future. And they don't. They don't get jazz. And they and, and they don't get Jimi Hendrix either. Yeah. Uh, I really like what you said uh, when you were quoting from the Our Father lecture by Steiner, because if egotism comes in here, that's where the splits in all the religions come. It's somebody interpreting cosmic wisdom that they had as a drop that appeared in their mind for a second, and they think that's the whole ocean. And then they become egotistic about it, and then scientists in modern days name it. So scientists observe something in nature, observes it, and then names it their name. That is the greatest hubris that you can see in materialism, that something divine, something wise, then gets named after the person who accidentally saw it first. And literally, literally nothing but observing. So when you have a cosmic thought, that's the reason there's so many versions of all of this. People open themselves up, they empty themselves up to the degree that their ego will let them. But if they can't extinguish their ego, if they can't be humble, if they can't uh, make sure that their mouth doesn't have harsh words, if they can't make sure that their ears are only tuned to the divine, if they don't have those things, then you're going to get all the different interpretations. And that has caused us, again, to have so many splits in uh, religion and churches and spiritual beliefs that here in America, you can't name all the different spiritual groups. And they all, if you see, should I say, and any of them that you see that egotism is leading that group head the other way. I'm gonna read this quote from Steiner from the same lecture uh, to, get, to try to emphasize what I'm saying here. Human beings down here on earth have many different properties, but they do not possess a personal intelligence of their own. <laughs> Sorry, folks. All of you who think that you're so intelligent and you're in Minza and you think you have a high IQ, well, that's not yours. As a matter of fact, if you have a true thought, it absolutely isn't yours, if it's an absolute thought. Anyway, so going on. On the contrary, every time a human being is active on the earth, a drop of intelligence, a ray of intelligence proceeds from the universal intelligence and descends, as it were, into the head, into the body of the single human being, so that the human being, as he walks about on earth, shares in the universal cosmic intelligence, which is common to all. And when he dies, when he passes through the gate of death, the intelligence that was his returns to the universal intelligence, flows back again. But I want to emphasize, that's the end of the quote, that it's been changed because the way that John, John and I, I don't know that we've ever had a, a disagreement about a cosmic intelligent thought because it wasn't either one of ours. And because it was common between us and it came from a spiritual divine world, 
if you don't get your ego involved, then you'll see the truth. But if you get your ego involved, you're going to taint it. You're going to color it to the limitations of your own ego if you try to express it. And that's why when you have a spiritual experience, sometimes very, very good to not say a word to anybody about it. Because as soon as you start talking about it, you're going to, it's going to uh, basically devolve into uh, what someone thinks is a fantasy. But it's not a fantasy at all. It's Once you learn the language of the spirit, which is a moral language of the heart, and the heart becomes a super sensible organ, you can commune with these beings. Literally have conversations with them, but not in the sense that you hear a voice in your head because there is no sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, or any of the other seven types of senses in the spiritual world. What is there are qualitative relationships between beings. And if you, just as a hint, if you have a true angelic cosmic thought, it will always lead you to other spiritual beings in the hierarchy, just like this description from Steiner that I read for you. Our cosmic intelligence comes from the hierarchy and our higher imagination, inspiration, intuition comes from what they what they think what they, and what they do. In other words, we become their eyes and ears and hands in this realm and we become their divine agent. So if you get caught up thinking that you're enlightened, you're not. And if you get caught up thinking this is your last incarnation because you're so evolved, you're incorrect. And this is what happens with the spiritual hubris, what we call spiritual materialism in America, where you get all the great teachers from the ancient cultures of the proper lineages, but none of that applies to today's age. It has to be transformed. So I've done all this study and all these religions and all these initiations, but the whole time I was making sure to filter it through what we're talking about today. And then you can see what it is that they're chasing, and it's the same thing that we're chasing, this um, transcendental experience of reaching the divine uh, through our own efforts, rising up from the heart into that spiritual world. So I really am glad that you uh, brought that out because that is absolutely critical. It's something I'm dealing with right now in an article I'm working on. Somebody who thinks they love to take Steiner and they'll quote Steiner, say he's right in everything, and then right after that, they'll say the opposite of Steiner. <laughs> and say that they got it directly from the time stream, that they time traveled and they got this information and they brought it to you. Uh, and they're the only ones who can get it. And they're the only ones that the spiritual world talks to. That is stupid. The sun shines on everybody, good and evil alike. And cosmic intelligence is there for you to rise up to. But if you experience it and you don't have a moral core to bring it back to, Sorry, you won't remember a single thing. So it's a fail-safe. The spiritual world doesn't allow cosmic intelligence to come live down here in limited egos, but in great spiritual beings like the Maitreya Buddha or Gautama Buddha or, uh, of course, Jesus Christ. All of those cosmic thoughts were able to come and dwell in them. But if they do, just like Christ, you're only going to be able to sustain that for a short period of time. Christ has sustained it for three years the full impress of cosmic intelligence all the way through the hierarchy, and as John pointed out, which is absolutely critical, Christ came from a realm above the nine hierarchies, all the way down to the human. No one, no spirit, nothing has ever done that before. And as Christ goes back, he's the water in the ocean. He raises all the boats. Anyone who wants to rise back up with the Christ can do that. So all of us have a Christ in self. We have a higher self, the manas, buddhi, uh, atman principles, or spirit, self, life, spirit, spirit, man, as Steiner calls them, many different names for these things. But if you get a good cosmology, the beauty of it is, if you can fill that cosmology into your brain, so your brain gets uh, basically completely filled up with all of its necessity to research and to have its curiosity answered uh, and to have the full picture, if you can get that cosmology of Steiner or whoever it is you want to use, as long as it's a really good comprehensive one, that prepares you. It prepares you to go from being a knight of the grail 
to being a guardian of the grail. But the guardian of the grail actually can only get there by going through the heart, by warmed up thinking, by stopping spiritual materialism, stopping the gray shadow, spider net webbed thinking of materialism, stop secular humanism, stop believing there's no life after death, and stop teaching that the human doesn't have a soul and the human doesn't have a spirit. Because we're talking about the wedding of your soul to your spirit. You don't need anybody to help you on this path. There are many spiritual beings, Michael, Sophia, all of the archangels, all of the hierarchy stand ready to help you, to give you cosmic intelligence if you can simply move your big fat ego aside. Speaking of big fat egos. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Mother Teresa uh, called me out on that. You know, and I'm glad she did. Douglas, you do such a good job. It's just when I met Mother Teresa, uh, it was so strange. She grabbed me, put her forehead to my forehead, and said like 50 times, keep teaching the children. I didn't say a word to her. I was a teacher. Keep teaching the children. Keep teaching the children. She wouldn't let go of me. She kept crying. Pretty soon I started crying. I didn't even know why I was crying. And then the person next to me pushes me away from her, <laughs> puts her head on, on her head and starts crying. And the two of them go over the corner and cry for, I forget, a couple hours. <laughs> so I don't even know what that means, but I took it seriously. I'm trying to keep teaching the children. <laughs> yeah, that was just after she told me I was too vain. <laughs> Is that right? Were you there? Yeah. Yeah, oh, so yeah. you were right in front of me or something? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. We waited forever to get in to see her. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was in Detroit. <laughs> we, you know, literally the line went out of the church and down the street and around yeah. the block. And she stopped seeing people after our friend, whose name I'm not going to mention, she's in heaven now, yeah. uh, grabbed a hold of her. And the two of them became fast friends. But of course, that person was also friends with John Paul II, the Pope. So yeah. she got around to all these Catholic spiritual people. And I'm not promoting Catholicism. I'm promoting you creating your own spiritual church, you finding your own spiritual North Star, because everyone can do it, because that drop of intelligence is not only in your head, the etheric drop of Christ is in your heart. And you don't need to believe in Christ for that to affect you. You can, in fact, experience your own Christ and self, experience the life spirit and you will see that you can't rise to that realm without understanding Christ uh, completely permeates that realm. So, But Christ in the spiritual world will be different than what you have ever been taught about Jesus of Nazareth, who became the Christ, unless you study anthroposophy, the teachings of Rudolf Steiner. Yes. Well, I accept you be as little children. You shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so that points to a very sacred mystery, and we have to be able to overcome our sheath nature and return to that being that we were at around three years of age when we started to have self-reference. But if we can cross that threshold and enter into that pristine childlike uh, nature, then we'll find Christ. Because what Christ is, is uh, representing in Earth evolution that three-year period is is the three years of, of the child. And so Rudolf Steiner said that it was a, a cosmic necessity that he could only do that for around three years because that is the actual cosmic process itself. And that is the, the that sacred ancient child mystery. And and that is, is something that's very, very special. And, and that is what you arrive at if you can just uh, take the meditation I gave some time ago and, and go through the various stages, you could see that the first stage is to, to come into a relationship to what you were just before you were born and, and carry that forward. That's, that's pointing towards that, that mystery. And I, I, I want to get at some point in our discussion talking about uh, the... Orthodox priest George Radhanaya and his death spirit experience to where he, it was the infants that were his guides. He was in a hospital 
and he had, was dead for three days. And, and the ones guiding him through the experience were the infants in the hospital. And in fact, there was this one infant that came to him and, and told him that he had a, had a broken uh, leg, uh, that it, it, it had become uh, dislodged from the socket during uh, birth. And so he told uh, the doctors when, when he came back alive and they went in and he inspected this child and it was true, they dislocated the child's leg. So the child had told George while he was in the after death state uh, to have them help help him out and he did. So that there's this very sacred mystery going on here and and it, but it requires the reverence. And and we live in a very irreverent age. They they make fun of everything. And you have to have a sacred space at some point in your life, at some point of the day, to where you retreat retreat from the profanity of the world and be able to acknowledge the sacred space. And to the extent that you do that, you're going to be able to rise above all this a world of falsehood in which we're surrounded with. And if you want to contribute uh, towards my humble efforts here, uh, I have a, a little link at paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell. That's funny. Yeah, you kind of cut out there. Got my 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 uh, browser crashed all of a sudden. Anyways, uh, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888 if you want to buy me a cup of coffee for these little endeavors. And uh, make sure you go to Doug and Tyler's American Intelligence Media, and that'll give you uh, links on the landing page to all the other wonderful work that, that, that they've done and, uh, and our friends at Americans for innovation with Michael McKibben. But uh, Douglas, I can't thank you enough. This is so nourishing for me. Now, it's not only nourishing for the angels, it's nourishing for me to be able to talk with you. And I hope that it's nourishing for our friends here because we've been having these kinds of conversations for so many years now that I often find myself, well, I wonder what Douglas would think about this. And I, I may experience the frustration of trying to call you and not hearing from you. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time you get back, I don't remember what. <laughs> but that's okay. That's right. Well, I always call you when I need to get uh, wisdom that oozes out of your pores to make sure that I'm on the right track. It's always a pleasure for all these years to uh, basically do what Mother Teresa told me. And she probably said it. You were probably standing next to me. Keep teaching the children. Keep teaching. Because we have to. We have to keep waking up and keep seeking the truth. And let's not forget in this world that there's the law of nations. And Emmer Avatel, the principles of natural law apply to the conduct and affairs of nations and of sovereigns. And this is a translation of the 1758 edition by Charles Fenwick. And this book, this is a special edition of that, but the, you can get it on archive.org, but those of you that are trying to find the basis for, for the larger community, the global community, and its, its wholesome possibilities, that's just a little hit. I like to occasionally drop a little thing in here or there because that book, Thomas Jefferson consulted that book as did James Madison and George Washington. And, and that was the book that they used to, to, to base as a foundation for understanding our relationship to the world and, and the various community of nations. And so, although we want to be able to transcend the sheath nature, it's important that you bring yourself into a rightful understanding of what that is. It's no big deal if you transcend something that you don't understand. Douglas, thank you so much. Thank you, John. And, and thank Tyla for, for 
letting me have you for this uh, brief uh, episode in, a, in our explorations. Hopefully we've approached closer to that other shore. Oh, don't worry. Uh, I'll have to do double work later to make up for this hour and a half. <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah, Much fine. love.